Welcome to our Air Miners Carbon Dioxide Removal Policy event. So my name is Jason Grillo. I'm the event director for Air Miners. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. Wanted to back up and talk about why we're having this event today. So uh, in particular in the United States, but I feel, but we feel worldwide, policy is becoming ever more critical to the development of the carbon dioxide removal industry. Um, certainly in, uh, in the United States where I live, uh, we've uh, achieved a moment where CDR is getting heightened attention to the extent that we haven't seen in the, in the past. So accordingly, as we move to develop the thousand shots on goal that are gonna be necessary to remove uh, gigatonnage of carbon, of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, we need to better understand as startups at an early stage, at a later stage, some of the policy levers that can help drive this industry forward. To that end, we've assembled an outstanding panel of people in, today to discuss how they have charted the waters of uh, government policy in order to achieve the uh, levels of development that they have at their organizations. Um, we have Rob Niven from Carbon Cure, Itasha Kay from Opus 12, and Peter Reinhardt from Charm Industrial, and we also have Erin Burns, who is uh, at Carbon, who many of you know at Carbon 80. She's now the executive director at Carbon 180. Especially thank you, Erin, for uh, agreeing to moderate our discussion today. A um, couple of words on logistics. We are going to go through our, as we usually do, our panel discussion for about 35, 40 minutes, followed by Q&A. Please keep your comments in the chat and put yourselves on mute during the duration of our 60 minutes today. Uh, like I said, after about 40 minutes, we'll, we'll move to audience Q&A, tie up at, with some concluding remarks toward the top of the hour, and then we'll have, as we usually do, our networking session uh, after the top of the hour. Feel free to depart after that, but we'll do Zoom breakout rooms in, uh, to uh, get people to know one another, collaborate together. So with that, uh, thanks everyone. Looking forward to hearing what our illustrious panel and moderators have to have to say today. And I will leave it to Erin Burns from Carbon 180 to take it from here. Erin. Thank you, Jason. So like Jason said, there is a lot happening in federal policy around carbon removal. We're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars for R&D. We're seeing deployment policies. Um, and I think what's even more exciting than all of that is that we have a new administration, a new Congress who are interested in doing even more, who see this as a central, as carbon removal as a central tenant of any climate action. Um, I think it's always been really important and I've, uh, to, to have startups and entrepreneurs and innovators involved in forming federal policy and advocating for federal policy. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with the folks on our panel today around exactly that and seeing the impact that they can have in DC when they come and tell their stories. They can get better policies, they can get policy moving more quickly. Um, and we wanna make sure, I think as policy people, that we do have policies that are specifically helpful to the entrepreneurs in this field, that we don't have three or five or 10 carbon removal and carbon tech companies, we have hundreds. Um, to that end, I'm super excited to talk about what they do in policy, why they care about policy, how they think about it, um, and to hear from questions from everybody. So um, Jason uh, gave a quick introduction to everybody. So I think we can hop right into questions. I know Tito also posted the event page with more info on the speakers, but um, I wanted to kind of jump in. I mean, we can go through each of you. Um, you can introduce yourself briefly, but I'd love to hear from each of our panelists a little bit about why you all care about policy. Um, and I'm going to call on Natasha first. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm Natasha Kay, the co-founder of Opus 12, um, also the chief science officer. And for those who aren't familiar with Opus 12, we are um, a startup based in Berkeley, California, and we're building electrochemical reactors to convert carbon dioxide into higher value products using metal catalysts and electricity. So creating a world in which renewable electricity can be used to make uh, carbon neutral liquid fuels and, and other materials out of CO2. Um, so why do I care about policy? Well, first, um, you know, Opus 12 is in part a product of good policy from the past. Um, 
we've been able to, you know, take an idea that we came out of with in graduate school that was, you know, partly funded by federal research grants from National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, and then um, take those ideas and, and start a company. And we were able to leverage a national lab that's supported by the Department of Energy, utilize really expensive equipment um, on a time basis that we didn't have to buy as a company, which allowed us to build our product a lot quicker and a lot faster. We're able to use multi-user facilities like the molecular foundry at the, at the national lab. We've gotten SBIR programs, which is a direct policy uh, position where federal agencies that were giving you know, billions of dollars of funding are required to give about 2% of that funding to small businesses. And the National Science Foundation in particular is really focused on a scalable startups. And so we got some early stage funding from, um, from those agencies, you know, and, and even still today, we, we get funding from NASA, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, um, and these other um, federal agencies. And all of that came out of someone in the past saying, this is something that the nation needs, and we wanna support this effort. So first is, is kind of a paying it forward. Um, secondly, I mean, we see a direct benefit to um, these policy decisions generating a lot of interest amongst the private sector. You know, when we first got started, um, we had a lot of explaining to do and as to why uh, carbon removal or carbon utilization was important. And now that that's become more and more in the national presence, we now have people coming to us already with that knowledge and understanding and seeing where um, there's trends in this direction and where there'll be a, a future market in which our company can be a player in. And so for us, that really helps us to bring people on board, to bring additional stakeholders within our company from all the way from investors to even um, hiring. Um, we have, um, we hire folks now who are you know, much more aware of the grander um, scheme around um, you know, what the, the policy directions are gonna be and, and learning about that from this new administration and other, and other sources. Um, and so, so in addition to bringing stakeholders and, and knowledge in, um, it also helps us think about, you know, again, like the economics of our company. Like when we first got started, we saw that there, you know, we needed to be economical without relying on kind of these um, kind of, you know, maybe even like carbon credits or things like that. But now that those are becoming more and more of a reality, it is an extra pool that we can leverage. We can say, okay, we can be cost competitive and there's an extra bonus that you can look at. And, it's, and, and that has um, brought more companies to the table and um, made the economics just that much better. And having uh, strength in, in seeing where these policies are going that we can fit directly into them has been really great for kind of the future outlook of our company. Great, thank you. Uh, Peter, can I ask you, why are you interested in policy? Yeah, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Charm, and just as brief background on Charm, we basically put oil back underground, so we remove carbon from the atmosphere by converting rotting biomass into bio-oil, which is a dark, viscous, carbon-rich fluid, and then we pump it underground into geological sequestration. Uh, so it, it stays underground better than CO2, uh, it's cheaper than direct air capture, we're under contract to deliver about 3,500 tons to corporate buyers like Stripe, Shopify, and Microsoft. Uh, we completed our first demonstration injections in Oklahoma in January, uh, a bit over 100 tons of CO2 equivalent. And so the reason that we're interested in policy um, is that CO2 injection is currently recognized under 45Q at the US federal level and uh, ditto to the low carbon fuel standard at the California level. And so in both the existing regulations support direct air capture and ge geological sequestration of CO2 specifically as a chemical, um, but we really want to push that to extend recognition to uh, bio oil sequestration, which accomplishes the same thing and is uh, the cheaper and more permanent method. So that's that's our specific interest is uh, sort of recognizing a parallel pathway to CO2 sequestration. Great. And Rob, I think you maybe have been in the kind of federal and state local policy game longer than um, a lot of folks in this space. I would love to hear why you guys uh, care about policy. Uh, thanks a lot, Aaron, um, and appreciate all the other panelists and having me on. Uh, Carbon Cure is a company that uses uh, CO2 in the production of concrete. 
Uh, we're operating now in a little over 300 plants worldwide. Uh, most of that is in the U.S., but we're trying as actively as possible to push that into international markets, especially emerging markets. Um, you know, my my job is is to think about uh, how we achieve our our 500 megaton uh, mission of CO2 reductions by 2030. And as I think about that, I, I you know, I came to policy from that lens. And what I mean by that is there's there's only so much and so fast you can go through organic growth. And you know, your sales teams are only so good and your marketing teams and your technology is only so attractive. So you need to look at other levers that can accelerate. Um, and certainly policy is one of those. And so I, I came at it from that very much problem solving perspective. Uh, we started, uh, despite being a Canadian company, uh, so I have some experience international as well. Um, we really achieved our sort of cut our teeth on policy development in Hawaii, uh, which is a wonderful policy environment, working at the uh, subnational level at state and municipal, and and found that there was a lot of um, uh, aligned and interested stakeholders. And mission alignment is always so critical for getting things done, uh, as we all know. Uh, so we developed the uh, framework there, uh, had some success, created that momentum, and then now have been focused very much on other type of deployment policies, which I should say is our main interest right now. Um, uh, we certainly benefited, like uh, Itasha said before, on um, a lot of the work that had been done before on innovation policies, and that's why we're here today. But now we're looking about building foundations for deployment policies, largely in the form of uh, procurement, in our case, procurement of concrete uh, that's made from uh, uh, CO2, and also looking to remove any regulatory barriers that exist today um, that preclude the effectiveness of policies. Because I think just looking at policy alone is inadequate, because there's oftentimes uh, these regulations which block progress from happening, even if the policy is in place. Uh, so happy to expand upon that and would love also to touch upon some of your earlier comments on coalition building. I, I think it's really important that we have a more unified voice if we're really going to try to get things done. Great, thank you. Um, so I think one of the questions I, uh, I have for you guys and I think um, comes up a lot in the spaces, say you find yourself in the position where you realize policy is something that is worth some of your time, right? You, you've decided that this is important for the future of your company. How do you get started? You know, how do you learn about what policies are out there? How do you figure out um, the kind of current landscape who's engaged in policy? Um, and how do you figure out what's most important in policy for your company? So, you know, there are lots of policies that we've touched on things like R&D and innovation in those DOE programs that Itasha's company was able, and Itasha as a person were able to take advantage of. We've heard about things like the 45Q tax incentive that Peter hopes to, uh, to take advantage of. Rob's role, Rob's um, efforts on, on federal and state level procurement. So I'd love to hear from you guys a little bit about how you get started in policy and those, what are, what specific resources were helpful? What specific steps did you guys take you found really impactful? We're also just having a discussion now. So any three of you jump in. I'm going to stop calling on people. Well, I can start again. Um, I, I think for us, um, you know, we were uh, initially very head down in, in building the technology. And we still very much, um, you know, focus on building technology and deploying it. Um, and, and kind of along the way, um, as we start to see the, the role that policy was playing in, in, in both the past, present, and future of our company, um, we started to uh, engage more and we, we still, again, don't have someone who's dedicated to policy. Like I'm, I'm probably the closest to that. Um, and what, what I did to really kind of get up to speed was to look into company or nonprofits really that are kind of focused on uh, this type of development engagement. So Carbon 180, of course, is a huge resource for um, those types of policy discussions. Um, and how things are shaping up and some of the under, underpinning efforts of that. There are other groups, sort of the Rodian Group did a report on direct air capture. Um, there's also the Hamilton Project at Stanford or, or a couple of resources that I, I looked into that um, are, are really, you know, as a economic and policy things and kind of can dive into these things on a large level and kind of distill the information down um, to where I can kind of quickly get up to speed. And of course, just being in the company itself, I, I can see where 
there's friction and places in which um, policy could come in and really make a difference. And so we've sort of generated our own ideas as a company. We've had just sort of policy discussions and we brought ideas and, um, and you know, one way that that became apparent was, for example, in the 45Q, when that um, uh, you know law eventually came into to being, we realized that we wouldn't qualify for it, you know, at least initially because the minimum threshold was um, sufficiently high to where our first our first commercial deployments wouldn't meet that. That's that's of course changing, but you know, having um, having awareness that that's happening, and then having um, at least our thoughts and like the fact that we exist being within this the sphere of those who are making that law um, can help to tailor it to incorporate companies such as ours and technologies such as ours and and making sure that we can kind of speak broadly for the industry as opposed to just um, lobbying for our specific um, technology when those policy discussions do come knocking at our door. Yeah, I think for us, very tactically, when we were very heads down on just sort of building the underlying technology and testing it, uh, it took us a while to even identify like what the appropriate aspects of policy or regulation were relevant. Uh, and so we just started hearing in conversations with customers, references to LCFS, references to 45Q. And so once we started to hear those references, then we decided to just go down the rabbit hole of actually reading those regulations and trying to wrap our head around them. Uh, and once we started trying to do that, then we actually found that our investors were a very good pathway to people who are far more knowledgeable about policy. Uh, I think investors tend to often be involved philanthropically in, in policy work uh, as well. And so they ended up being a really nice bridge over to Carmen 180, for example, uh, and others. Um, so I think that was sort of our pathway. Um, and then once you get plugged into the policy world, it's deeply interconnected, of course, just like any other uh community and and so then it becomes a lot easier to navigate and figure out how to uh, how to go from there i i think it's also worthwhile like it's uh, to provide a bit of a cautionary note like depending upon the the stage you are in developing uh your your enterprises uh this is like it's good to understand that this is not a quick thing um and like just the rate of change that happens and it's also not a sure thing uh so when when we got first started i remember uh, first getting involved in this at the federal level and in, in our case in Ottawa, Canada. And, uh, you know, you, you, you know, hire your lobbyist, you, you get your pitch deck together and you, you go and share this. And, and I, I did find it a bit deflating at first because you didn't, you don't see any progress. You don't know if anything sticks. It's like a black hole. You sort of throw it over the fence and everyone always says, yes, that's, those are great ideas, but it's really hard to see anything actually come from it. Um, so I, I think it's good just to set expectations as well as uh, this should not be like your company building enterprise. Um, and it can be very useful uh, to be able to advocate for things. But I think the more specific you are, um, the more like tactile or sorry, um, tactical uh, you, you are on specific points, the more success you're going to have and recognize that it can, you know, it can be done sort of guerrilla style which I, I'm personally am supportive of, <laughs> but going the lobby route, um, it, it can also be useful, but it can also feel like you're paying a lot of money just for someone to schedule meetings for you because they don't actually join you in the meetings and they don't share any insights or, or you don't really know what happens. Um, you don't know whether you can have those meetings yourself without paying someone to do that for you. So I, you know, I, I, I just think it's worthwhile is showing like a bit of a perspective on this is, this um, the most important thing for starting uh, CDR companies is like the technology, the business, getting that done. And this is like a secondary or tertiary thing. That's super helpful. Um, and I think the um, the timeline on this, I think, is really important, too, because I think something that comes up a lot is um, and part of the reason uh, we wanted to engage really early with companies on the policy side is that sometimes we'll get companies coming in and saying, okay, we need this policy change in the next six months. I will tell you at the federal level, the 45Q tax incentive, the updates that took seven years, that's a pretty long time. But for a lot of this, we're talking uh, a year is the speediest policy success you've ever seen. Uh, this stuff takes time. So engaging early, I think is really important. Um, Rob, really building on your point about um, this shouldn't be your first 
uh, this isn't really your business case, isn't just and totally based on policy. Your first priority is really the technology. Can you guys talk a little bit about how you do think about what to prioritize? When do you prioritize policies? And then how do you think about which policies to prioritize? How do you spend your time? And I think to your point, Bob, and uh, maybe Peter, you can speak to this as well. There are other resources out there. There are, you can hire lobbyists. Um, there are some lobbyists who have particular expertise in this, um, in the kind of carbon management field. So how do you guys think about about choosing those priorities within policy? How do you think about prioritizing policy as a piece of your work overall? And then what are some of those resources you found helpful to think, to, to kind of utilize um, and to make sure that you guys are spending your time in the best way possible? Uh, I guess maybe I'll, uh, I'll lean into uh, answering this on, on how we've thought about it. I guess the, the role that policy plays for us is in helping accelerate us down a cost curve. And I think that's important context, which is there's there needs to be some existing set of premium markets. Like if you think like Tesla starts with the model, uh, the Roadster, and then the Model S and the X, and then the three, and then the Powerwall, and then grid scale storage, and so on. They're really a battery company that's moving through these markets from highly premium markets to much more commodity markets. And so I think you need to have a set of markets like that. And, and Charm has a set of markets like that. I'm sure Rob and Natasha have those uh, markets as well and an understanding of how you're gonna come down those cost curve in existing markets. And I think policy for us plays a role in making some of those markets more premium. So if we can raise the premium level of the carbon removal market, for example, that helps us accelerate down the cost curve because there's a little bit more there there. But it can't establish, I wouldn't bet the company on establishing an entirely new market or drastically expanding a market. So I guess maybe that's the sort of first point of where the focus needs to be is really on Policy can play this small role to Rob's point in, in, in that premium aspect, but, but not in establishing the market in the first place in almost all cases. Um, and then in terms of how we're kind of approaching it, I guess I should, I should level set that we're by far the newest of this group in terms of policy work. Um, everything that I've learned has been heavily influenced by, by the folks on this call. So uh, in particular, Aaron. Um, so we haven't actually accomplished anything yet in terms of policy change. I think Rob and Natasha have much more experience there. So I have to check back as to kind of whether this approach works, but. Um, the way that we've been approaching it tactically is building a coalition of like-minded companies um, and then to identifying really specific legislators or regulators, like specific people that we can, uh, that we can go after to really convince them that need to be convinced. Um, so 45Q, for example, that'd be Senator Manchin on the Senate Energy Committee or Doggett and Sewell on the House Ways and Means Committee. And then third, who are the people who influence those specific legislators? So kind of build this map from there. Um, and this is folks like Carbon 180, ClearPath, um, and, and so on for 45Q, very specific influencers. And then fourth, who are the broad influencers who can actually create groundswell in academia or the philanthropic worlds for this change? And so for 45Q, that's people like Julio Friedman at Columbia or Roger Ains at Lawrence Livermore, David Keith at Harvard. And so building out that whole map of influencers has been a really big project for us over the past few months. Uh, and then have a different approach, which I think is getting at your question more specifically, Aaron, different approach for each of those, which is, you know, for that second tier targeting the specific regulators, we actually are going to, we have hired a lobbyist to, to help drive really targeted conversations. Rob, I'd say our experience with lobbyists is a little, maybe a little different. Like they've gotten crazy meetings for us that we never could have gotten ourselves and like, are there in every meeting and are like building a relationship and like smooth talking and like, you know, their way through the like social connections there. So um, anyways, I, I think a really good lobbyist actually does do a lot. Um, uh, maybe we just got lucky in, in finding someone there. Um, and then for these third and fourth tiers where we're kind of networking our way into the influencer and, and groundswell, we're just giving quarterly updates to keep people informed, uh, keep ourselves excited, top of mind. And the idea is that when if we can successfully use our lobbyists to bring something to bear in terms of an actual proposed change, then all of these people will receive calls as to whether this is a good idea and we want them to say, yes, it's a good idea. Um, anyways, we'll see if this works, but that's our plan. No, I was just going to say, I think um, that sort of tiered approach can be really effective in my experience. And I'll say I'll, I'll, a very quick anecdote. I actually first met Noah at Carbon 180, um, who was a, one of our co-founders, if you guys haven't met him. But uh, when I was working in the Senate for Senator Manchin, 
And he came in and I didn't know him. I was working on carbon capture, but not director of capture. This was years ago, about six years ago now. And the first thing I did was to say, please go talk to, her name is Shannon Angelski. She runs the Carbon Utilization Research Council. Peter, if you're working on 45Q, I'm guessing you've run into Shannon. Uh, and I said, go talk to Shannon. If she says like that you're okay, then uh, we'll do that amendment. And that's exactly what we did. And I think um, that sort of network that you guys talked about and the sort of um, making sure that you're thinking not just about talking to those policymakers, but to the pol you know, policymakers have a lot on their plate. Their staff are very, very busy. They're going to call, make some calls and check and, and call people like Julio to ask, is this technical? And they're not, by the way, most Hill staffers um, are not technical experts. So they're not going to know if Peter, if your technology is something that they should be supporting or not, they're going to call people like Julio and make sure. So I think that's um, what I've seen be really impactful, but would love to hear Atasha and Rob, if you guys have anything you want to mention on how you guys think about prioritization. Uh, yeah, I think like, Sorry, go, go on, Natasha. Well, I would say for us, I mean, um, you know, we, we still kind of leverage and utilize, I would say, the Google system and, and coalition that we're a part of. Um, a lot of our policy um, conversations have been inbound. Um, you know, we, we participated in Carbon 180's Carbon Tech Day on the Hill, and that was really great. And that uh, really opened our eyes to, you know, the, the ability we have to just go and talk to our representatives. And so now we're kind of building out a more proactive um, conversation with different um, politicians. We also are doing the same thing with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where we've been able to utilize the molecular foundry there and other uh, programs that they have. And so we've been, um, you know, eager participants and supportive of their kind of larger uh, policy directives. And so we can, we've really been leveraging an ecosystem in which we've, we've been operating um, and only recently starting to kind of be more uh, targeted and focused and kind of think about our own kind of uh, policy plans. We still very much will um, very happily um, hop onto larger efforts. So I think at least from my experience, um, policy discussions have been more fruitful when um, you know I can just be representing a larger CCUS or larger uh, industry and maybe even advocating for policy decisions that aren't necessarily going to direct open, uh, directly benefit Opus 12 but kind of creating that again that ecosystem that coalition I think uh, people that I've talked to that then tend to come back and, and recommend me for um, follow on conversations because they know that I'm kind of thinking more broadly. And, um, and that has, I think, fed um, more conversations around that and more inbound. So I think, you know, being part of ecosystems, being part of, of groups that are establishing themselves as thought leaders in this space is one way to, to kind of uh, bring yourself along for those conversations. I absolutely agree with like the last, last, like all the last two points here. Um, and just to add on to that, like is some things that we've found to be helpful that may others may find as well is like, it's good to really understand like, like what Peter said, the change you want to make, but to write that down on a, on a, a policy brief. Uh, so we've uh, shared, shared our policy page, uh, which is online and you can download our briefs, which make it very clear. I think what policy requirements your, our policy changes you're looking to make. I, I think that's a very good thing to do. I think also contributing uh, with uh, other think tanks is another way of indirectly engaging with policymakers. So if uh, Carbon 180 is, is writing their next policy paper on something, uh, I think being looked at as someone that can help contribute or any of these other groups um, that are uh, working on these issues like um, Climate Works and there's so many uh, of these very well-regarded groups. That's another way to get your ideas out there in front of policymakers. And another thing that I've found to be very, very helpful is that I, I think that uh, policymakers, uh, you can really get their attention if you're going into these meetings with a broader coalition than just technology companies, but also industry partners, especially industry partners from their ridings um, or their districts, I should say. So that's that can really have uh, have an impact. So in our case, is if we can go in together with a local, you know, very blue collar concrete um, plant that's employing hundreds of people, 
in their district and it's in you know small town America or wherever it might be a metropolitan area that really resonates um, that and then and then you can really have a lasting impact if there's a way that you can find uh, to get them on site to actually tour something um, and and get on their work boots and hard hats those are the things that they'll never forget and it'll have a very lasting impact so when they're thinking about a policy it's not abstract anymore they can think of people and jobs and an impact and like real tangible stuff that that's gold when when you can try to arrange that i think that's a fantastic point especially when we're talking about things that maybe aren't as familiar um, to them. We're talking about new technology, new fields, um, that making it really tangible to policymakers um, and seeing it not just in the real world, but, you know, potentially, like you said, in their state, in their district, um, seeing how this could help their constituents, I think I couldn't have put it better, is gold. Um, one thing also, Rob, that you hit on is kind of been touched on a little bit so far is that coalition piece. And Natasha, you talked about this, the coalition building, coordination, can we, get, can, can we talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that is so important in policy. I would say very rarely, if ever, does any policy success happen because of a single actor. Um, we think about coalition building and, and formally and informally coordination in the policy space. That's really how we've had success in policy. But I would love to hear from your all's perspective. When you guys were starting out, how did you think about that coordination and coalition building? So were you, you guys have talked about a couple of partners. You've talked about some industrial partners You've talked, um, Rob, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, you, you mentioned kind of local groups. I think that's a really interesting perspective that maybe doesn't happen in federal policy advocacy as much, or you know, bringing in people who have ties to those states or districts and how you made those connections. Um, but also other partners outside of maybe the NGO space or industrial space, like are there other people that you're building coalitions with that you're doing that outreach to? I, I, I think Peter mentioned investors. Um, uh, more and more, the really high value investors are have already have a big presence in this area. So uh, they're going to be way more influential than than a, a tech startup. You know, don't um, like definitely don't kid yourself. Um, so uh, so I think having them aligned and sharing your policy views with them. So when they're having discussions, they're picking up nuggets that uh, you're sharing with them, or maybe something a little more formal. But I think where we are right now is like, we need more of a formal, I think we're doing, I think it's evolved. I think we've gone from like individuals going out there and sort of peppering ideas, having um, some progress to these sort of informal things where we like share ideas and write really nice policy papers, but it's probably time that we get into something formalized. Uh, I, I don't think that exists for the CDR space yet. Um, and then of course, like, I think the challenge there is like, you know, who's who's part of the group and who's not part of the group, right? Because people are going to have differing interests and different levels of ambition. And sometimes you might want to bring a group in, but you know, they're a little more timid. Um, so that's part of the game, right? It's like you, um, <laughs> you have to try to find that common ground, but I, I don't think it exists, but that's certainly what I would recommend that we, we need to do next. If we're, and we I need to do it now because the time is now. Yeah, I, I just want to plus one that sentiment around investors. I mean, if you look at uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, um, you know, they're able to really bring attention to uh, various companies in the sort of clean tech space, not just carbon removal, but um, they their voice and um, what they do um, can bring a lot of weight and they're effectively building a coalition with their portfolio companies. There's, of course, other groups too that, um, you know, Elemental Accelerator, Activate, um, these other kind of um, fellowship or incubator programs where they are, um, you know, vetting these uh, companies that are in this space and then someone who um, is looking to do a, a policy push or look for ideas can kind of approach these kind of form ecosystem or groups to pull in different players and different ideas and they often will have the, the big industry players as well as the small startups already kind of brought together into one common theme and focus. Um, so I think those can be um, really great ways to build coalitions in a way that we have also um, kind of leveraged those ecosystems to be a part of the policy discussion. 
We've had a little bit more trouble uh, finding a coalition to build. There's a there's a lot of folks focused on utilization and injection of carbon dioxide specifically, but our fundamental issue of sort of like recognizing other types of uh, ways that carbon might be chemically bound. Um, we haven't found a lot of folks that are uh, that are sort of running in that direction. So, anyways, if actually if anyone on this call uh, knows of companies that are doing really interesting things with carbon bound in other ways than CO two very interesting potential coalition uh, partners for us uh, in our policy work. But um, yeah, been, been harder to find find folks for the sort of uh, goals that we're after so far. Yeah, and I'll mention, Peter, to that point, I think one of the things that we've seen actually even in 45Q and the kind of history of it is, um, one is when you, you know, Itasha mentioned the threshold issue. Um, the, like, that's something that we've seen a lot of companies, you know, flag as a, as a potential issue. Rob, you guys may have uh, mentioned that as well. Um, but I think that there are several changes to 45Q that are being discussed. I think one, if you can if you can build those partnerships with people who are asking for changes at the same time um, and get included in that. But I'll also mention um, the updates of 45Q that were passed in 2018. They actually passed, very, it, there was a very intentional alliance between not just carbon capture, carbon removal companies, but with two other tax credits, one for advanced nuclear, one for renewables, and uh, the people advocating for all of these kind of got together and said that, you know, we're a package, we, you should really think of us as a package and um, really help build a coalition. So I think this is something that is continually a theme in policy. Um, I actually, um, I have I have two more questions. So I'm gonna ask one and see if we have time. I wanna make sure I leave time for other people to ask things. But really quickly, I talked a little bit, I mentioned before that, um, that uh, policymakers aren't necessarily the most technical people or their staff. I'll say, like, I do not have a technical background. Um, I worked in the Senate for four years on energy policy, but I'm not, uh, I have a degree in cultural anthropology. And lots of us, you know, come from those sort of um, uh, non technical backgrounds. What are some of the lessons you've learned and how to communicate your, your technology, why it's important, and sort of why, you know, what the interplay of policy is. And I think about, you know, I met with Peter not that long ago to hear about his work. I know that you guys are introducing your technology to people a lot. Um, Rob, this is something I think you guys probably have a long history of experience. I would love to hear a little bit about how you think to communicate to policymakers. Can anyone make a comment? I'm sorry, can anyone make a comment? Oh, no, sorry. This is just for the panelists, but um, in a minute we'll have Q&A. Okay. I think the, uh, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, you know, the biggest breakthrough for us was uh, the concept of put oil back underground as just like a very kind of simple visual metaphor for what we're doing. And then to build on top of that uh, with sort of more complexity and technical nuance. Um, but um, I actually think the biggest learning for me, Aaron, was in hearing your background of just like how much you covered as a legislative assistant. I don't know if you want to just share that list of like you covered energy policy, yeah. but just share that full list of everything that you covered. And like when I think that totally changed my mindset of how to work with folks on the Hill. Yeah. So I worked on energy, labor, ag, public lands, including forestry, transportation, appropriations, and then gun. Uh, like gun. <laughs> Simultaneously, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so I didn't necessarily have all the time to, and, and to be clear, energy issues are super duper broad, all of that. So not just carbon management. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, I, just, just for us, like I, I find that, um, I think it's good to recognize that um, uh, you as a speaker of technology, of your own technology, are probably not the most credible source. Uh, of course, you have bias. Uh, so it's always good to be able to reference customers, industry players, investors, um, and reports that other people write about you. Uh, just good, just go into it realizing that, of course, you're going to love your own technology. Uh, every founder uh, does. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, reference customers. That's the best thing you can do. Yeah, um, this was definitely a big lesson learned on how to talk about our technology is still very much um, a lesson that I'm learning. Um, and for me, it's, it's, it's just talking to mainstream audiences, even outside of policy or, or um, congressional staffers, because what we do um, 
is literally the stuff uh, you can get a PhD in, um, in what we do, which, which is what I did before we started the company. And so it's, it's a lot of, you know, came from a place of a lot of jargon and, um, and that just doesn't uh, fly with getting people excited and understanding what we're doing. And so leave me when, when we first was starting the company, I did a uh, TEDx talk through Stanford and um, they um, put me with a coach and she was really great at being like, nope, no one knows what this word is, take it out or change this word or like, um, and she also gave this frame of like, think about uh, if I'm if I'm talking to a group of, of you know, high school students, um, how would I describe what I'm doing? And that, that framework was really great um, for me because, you know, people are, are like, you know, super smart, but like, if you, if you don't have like this deep technical information, it's just, it, you know, it's like high school is the one place where we kind of all have this baseline level of education and can like, if you think about describing it to a 10th grader, um, like that's the level in which you can reach some, you know, can be, can make it available and reach someone. And so that's kind of the frame that I, I, I leverage. And also, you know, again, like we're in a world where, where like Twitter sound bites are really important. So thinking about like, how would you tweet out the technology or how would you, um, you know, condensing down to a, a, a specific phrase can kind of um, resonate with people. Um, I do think though at the same time, we do need to have these more complex and detailed conversations. So um, I would love, um, you know, to create more spaces, which I think there are becoming more spaces where there's podcasts and there's, um, you know, more like educational videos where we can go in more detail because I think there is this um, kind of back-end educational piece of of like, like looking at the numbers and diving in and understanding like why we need to start removing carbon and why we need all hands on deck and why we, you know, there's not gonna be necessarily like, you know, one like killer solution. We need all of these solutions um, doing their own piece and and operating regionally and, and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so definitely kind of this mainstream mode of conversation and communication to kind of really line people and, and have it resonate. And then also, you know, building the back end of, of like, you know, detailed conversations and understanding and diving into the numbers, I think is really key. No, I think those are, I think uh, that's really great advice and something we even say in the policy space is sort of, how would you explain this to your family? Or, you know, if you're talking to your relative who doesn't work in this, how do you tell them what you do? And I think the same, like talking to, how would you tell high schoolers about this? And then I think being able to connect it to the larger piece, you know, why should they care about what you're doing? Why is this important? Because uh, it may be really evident to you, but um, I think being able to connect it to things that they're familiar with, priorities that they have, um, you know, why why they might work on this, I think can be really, really impactful. Um, thank you guys so much. So we've, we've been getting a lot of really fantastic questions. One that came up from Joe uh, or comment that came up from Joe and that we had in our notes to, to raise anyway is around environmental justice and how this can play a role. So. Um, I have a specific question around this, though, um, uh, you know, others, please feel free to chime in. But um, this is something we're seeing actually from uh, major climate policy now. Uh, the Green New Deal was really instrumental in kind of pushing this at the forefront of climate policy at the federal level. Um, we're seeing the Biden administration uh, push environmental justice as a part of all of their climate action. We actually saw two new appointments at the Department of Energy one around uh, workers and one around environmental justice. That's very new. They're thinking about how to embed this into what they do at the Department of Energy. Um, I will say we're coming out with a policy roadmap soon that is going to talk about this, not just as a separate piece of work, not environmental justice policy, but also how you bake that into all of the carbon removal work. Um, this is something that I think is going to continue uh, that, that not only from a moral perspective, but also from the perspective of effective policy advocacy, you have to be thinking about this as a company. And I'd be curious to hear, and I know Rob, you guys, you talked a little bit about working with local communities or, or partners who could talk about local communities. I'd love to hear from you guys, is this something that you're starting to think about those sort of local impacts, those community impacts, how you're gonna talk about the role of your technology uh, as part of more environmentally just carbon or a climate policy? For for uh, for me, it's really instrumental is to bring it down to the, the local level, and and if you can connect it with with jobs, that's that's even more important today than ever. Um, 
and and also local environmental impacts as well. Like perhaps there's co-benefits um, that relate to you know local air quality or or water or solid or um, and you know jobs jobs jobs. No one no one uh, ever hears enough of that either. So th those are are certainly very important points. If you can bring to the discussion about the why point that you brought up, Aaron, is so important. If those first ten words that you bring out and include something about um, local impacts. Uh, local impacts that we're looking at um, are, uh, you know, field burning is a huge problem in a lot of areas around the world. Is there a way for us to use that agricultural residue and, and take it out of the air, basically, from a particulate and, and smoke perspective? Uh, jobs as well, like we, we've started operating in Oklahoma now, and um, it's very interesting. Like you go to the rail yard in, in Oklahoma City and uh, uh, you know, it's not a, not a crew that you necessarily would be super stoked to be working on carbon removal, um, and yet there they are, and they are super stoked and super proud of it, and they like want to put charm stickers on their hard hats, and so like that kind of shift, I think that can happen in local communities, I think is really exciting, um, uh, and then also in, in as much as we're putting uh, oil in some form back underground, um, I think uh, you know there's potentially some opportunity there for us to figure out how to also look at capping wells that um, are spewing toxic stuff into um, if they're uncapped in, in all sorts of local and rural communities all over the uh, all over the world. So and those are some of the more local impacts that I think can uh, have a bit more of an environmental justice lens to them. Yeah, same for us that, um, you know, all of our deployments that we're planning right now are either in rural or, or industrial areas where we'd be taking CO2 emissions that would have gone into the air and utilizing them and therefore you know, creating more economic development, more jobs in the area and reduced emissions. I think one thing that just to, to add another element here that really, really, really resonates with policymakers is when you can talk about CO2 from a perspective of feedstock to make products. I know it's like obvious and we're all talking about that here today, but just to really emphasize that, this is immensely more attractive than paying a lot to, you know, put something away. So like if 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 we can create products from that, then it's 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 really interesting. Uh, and permanence is also a really key element as well. So we're not just recycling CO2, but um, putting it away. Um, uh, so these are some other concepts that I, I think are worthwhile putting into the why statement of when you try to get someone's attention. No, absolutely. Um, and I think, um, sorry. Um, no, I think that can be uh, really impactful. And I think, um, yeah, to your point about that sort of, um, yeah, I think making those connections and I think thinking about this as an opportunity. I think a lot of times policymakers can respond to that when you're framing this um, as an opportunity for them. If you come in and say, you've been thinking about CO2 all wrong, there's this huge opportunity. So I think all of that can really capture their imagination. And I think that's something, you know, uh, to kind of Peter's point about the things that policymakers work on and that their staff have these really big portfolios, that what they want to do is be really effective in policy. They want to make good policy, but they're also looking for places for their, um, for their offices to lead, to, to um, come in and, and have a real impact on policy. So if you can come in and say, this is an issue that people aren't working on yet, there's a big opportunity here. Um, this is really exciting and kind of capture their imagination. You're gonna get, um, you're gonna get a lot of like really dedicated support. Um, one question we got um, that I'd love, uh, Rob, if you could talk a little bit about, and you mentioned that you guys had done in Hawaii on procurement. Um, we've been talking a lot about federal policy. That's where we work at Carbon 180. Um, but how do you think about uh, kind of state versus federal, federal policy and where you guys have prioritized uh, kind of your focus? Uh, well, we, we actually started at, at, uh, at the city level um, and it's a, a lot more manageable. You can, uh, you can understand the process. It's a little easier to find. And so that was in Honolulu. And I should say all this and like, um, uh, I, I really want to emphasize the impact of elemental accelerator. They they really showed us the ropes on how to develop policy. So can't overstate that. Um, and then and then we gained some success there and then moved on to state uh, again through their their guidance. And then and then now have brought that to New York State um, by supporting the LECLA policy, which we think um, builds upon a lot of the precedent that was set in Hawaii. 
Uh, and then now we're having more and more conversations with this momentum that's happened. I should say there's also a, a, a considerable win there at the US Conference of Mayors, which represents about 1400 cities as well, that took the Honolulu resolutions and then spread that out across the country. I think all of this sort of momentum building has given us um, uh, sort of refined our approaches, refined our ideas, and also given us some precedents so that when we're speaking to federal policymakers uh, in the US or other, that it, they can point to that and they can say, okay, this does have a track record. It can be successful. It's worth spending my time on this because it, it makes sense and I know it works. Um, so for us, that sort of running start or like walk before you run has been really helpful because Washington and especially for a Canadian is um, really daunting and intimidating just to try to understand how to navigate through that quagmire, but it's, um, it can also be extremely impactful. Yeah, Peter, Tasha, I don't know if you guys had done as much state. You're welcome to jump in if you have opinions on state versus federal as well. Now I'm nervous. We're going the exact opposite direction. We're most active on 45Q and shifting towards LCFS uh, as a, as a short-term priority at the California kind of state level. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know how we would even formulate something at the city level. So I'm a little jealous, Robert. <laughs> yeah, same for us. We started on the federal level more in like the innovation space and, and only and recently have kind of captured some state level grants. I think what we've seen for state and municipal level that, um, that for like an early stage company as we you know, have been, um, that there's not a lot of um, kind of funding and policy at that level in the municipal and state. And that's changing a little bit that California is becoming more um, engaged in like the earlier stage technologies and and supporting sort of first of a kind deployments and early stage seed grants. Um, but when we first got started, there was um, hardly any of that. I think this really speaks to like understanding what you want to achieve and then going to the, the stakeholder group that you need to affect that change on. Like there's no right or wrong way of doing this, um, uh, but having that really strong clarity on what are your goals? What are the milestones you need to hit? Because like the last thing you want to do is just consider success as like, that goal three years from now is like you need to break it down. Yeah, um, I that that's super helpful. And yeah, I think that sounds like I think it really depends on your technology, what's available. I say I think also the difference between where we are right now in federal carbon management policy and where we were when Rob, you guys maybe start started getting involved. It's uh, really a world of difference. Um, I have two quick questions that I want to cover from the audience. One is um, of the first, and this was talked about in the chat a little bit, but of the first million dollars that each of your companies spent in total across all costs, about how much of that did you spend on policy? Same, same as Robert here, zero dollars. Uh, we've raised about three and a half million now. Uh, and of that, we would probably have spent about 30K just in the last few months as we were ramping up uh, lobbyists and uh, at both state and federal levels. Um, but yeah, super, super small. Um, Does that zero include your all's time? No. Uh, no. No, yeah, some more, some time. Our first million was really focused on building a prototype. Um, but we definitely, at that time, we were at um, Cyclotron Road, which is now Activate at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So we definitely got pulled into kind of larger policy discussion. So yeah, whatever value you'd put on my time at that point, um, which is still probably pretty low because we, we were basically paying ourselves as grad students. So um, there was that, that was spent, but otherwise there was no direct um, policy funding. Um, and actually, so around this question, I do want to mention, I think, um, so Atasha mentioned Carbon Tech on the Hill Day. Um, Rob, you guys have also participated in this, but I think um, one of the things that I always ask Atasha, we kind of break onto groups and I think not, not last year, um, but in 2019, we were able to be in person. You were in my group and one of the things I asked specifically was to tell that story of sort of 
how you uh, access DOE support throughout um, your work at Opus 12, because I think it's a really uh, great example of how policymakers want DOE to work, how they want to support companies and go through that process with things like Cyclotron Rogue slash Activate. Um, so I think one, I would say everybody who is curious about that, go bug Atasha, who I think has a really great story and I'm sure has a million pieces of really fantastic advice. But we also just saw an announcement for ARPA-C, the, the uh, ARPA-E equivalent for climate. Um, what are you guys thinking about? Are you guys thinking about um, what role ARPA-C, and I, I will say, I think this is, um, you can get RPC or RPE grants. Um, it's sometimes a little bit different than the traditional Department of Energy structure, but um, are you guys thinking about opportunities like RPC and how you might engage with them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we definitely have a very aggressive uh, uh, stance on kind of forming public-private partnerships. Um, I would love to see RPC have a broad approach of you know, certainly looking at early TRL technology and ideas and kind of the moonshot, which is similar to what RPE does, but also looking at later TRL technologies, first of a kind deployments, or even much more mature technologies, you know, how can, how can there be one aspect that's developed that lowers the cost across the board, maybe it's a manufacturing piece, or, um, you know, um, I think someone mentioned in the chat about having like a, a label of, of sort of like energy star, you know, these kind of um, things that are maybe like less sexy, aren't aren't like talked about as much, but uh, can definitely have a huge impact in the background. Um, along the lines of less sexy things, I think there's a lot of like infrastructure things that are just kind of ignored. Like we have a whole train system that still, um, you know, shifts cargo across the country and can be leveraged a lot more to to do transport in a much more low carbon way. But I think oftentimes like our train infrastructure um, doesn't get talked about in kind of like the climate conversation. Um, so I would love to see RPC kind of think about the, like updating these infrastructures and like doing the kind of dirty behind the scenes work. Yeah, um, that was super helpful. And um, I'm going to jump in here because I know we're coming up on time. So I want to just, first of all, thank our panelists. This was awesome. Um, you guys have, um, I think it's been really fantastic from my position at Carp80 to work with you guys uh, and to hear more about your work, to think about how we can create policies and then advocate for policies together uh, to support the work that you're doing. Um, thank you to Tito and Jason. I'll hand it back to you guys. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank you, Erin, for making this conversation really spring to life. Uh, and thank you, Tasha, Rob, and Peter, too. I uh, also want to take a moment to recognize uh, Chris Tullis. Um, you know, when we had our DOE event uh, three weeks ago, Chris came to us after that and said, hey, uh, let's do something more on the policy side of things, not just about government funding. And uh, we took it ran with it and without his vision, we wouldn't be here today. So thank you, Chris. Um, so great. We're not gonna conclude uh, in a minute or two, but I wanna bring up a couple of additional Air Miners events that we've got going on. For one thing, next week, we are going to have an environmental justice workshop building on the theme that we talked about a few minutes ago about uh, how can we implement principles of environmental justice in our practical day-to-day at our company. So we're through case studies of how to do so. Uh, later on, uh, in the later in the end of March, we're going to also have a, a women air miners event on uh, gender diversity in air mining. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Lots of events going on. Uh, this upcoming Friday, we've got a book club. We also have uh, orientation for people new to air miners coming up in a, in a couple of weeks and a Friday afternoon networking event. You can check that all out on our new and improved Air Miners calendar on conference.airminers.org. Thank you, Tito, uh, that where you can take a look at future events that are coming up. So with that, um, I'm gonna conclude, oh, uh, and go to our networking session. And also for people who are new to air mining, go to our boot up session too. Uh, bootup.airminers.org uh, to get into a study group. So with that, uh, thank you everyone and we will see you next time.